Okay, good afternoon, everybody. We're just going to wait for two or three minutes while people join us, um, and we'll start very shortly. Okay, um, welcome everybody to the Living with Disability Research Seminar this afternoon. Um, those of you who are in Melbourne, you will understand that we're all still at home and we all need a haircut, so you'll just have to uh, excuse our appearances. <laughs> Although one of our guests this afternoon is, is lucky enough to be in Canberra and he certainly doesn't need a haircut. So <laughs> we've got a really interesting afternoon. Uh, with a, a, a guest speaker from outside of academia um, and one of our very smart PhD students. And the sort of theme this afternoon then is about regulating and monitoring quality services, um, which is unfortunately an incredibly topical issue just at this point in time. So I, it's a great pleasure I introduce um, Dr. Alan Hoff, who um, many of you might know who is a consultant has been a consultant across the disability sector and has done quite a lot of work for ND, nds in the past um, but he also has some claims to some credibility in terms of having a, a phd um, in uh, governance and has done a lot of work with boards particularly of disability service organizations so i'm going to hand over to him and he's going to talk about regulation so over to you alan and welcome Thank you very much, Chris, and thank you for the invitation um, to join you this afternoon. Um, so this presentation reflects three papers uh, that I've uh, authored or co-authored. The first was a conference paper a couple of years back titled All Care, No Responsibility, Government Treatment of Providers Under the NDIS and the NDIS Quality and Safeguarding Scheme. If you're interested, that's on Academia or ResearchGate. It's also uh, reflecting a draft journal article with my co-authors Craig Furneaux and Yu Yu Zhang of QUT titled Assuring What and For Whom? The Case of Quality Audits in, the in a National Disability Insurance Scheme. And finally, there's a draft book chapter called Regulation of Quality and Safeguarding in Disability Service Provision. 
As Chris mentioned, my academic background is in not-for-profit organisations and organisational performance in particular. I have developing interests in disability service provision and in regulation. My research has largely been informed by management and sociological approaches, and that will be reflected in my presentation today. So my focus is on external regulation, although this inevitably links to internal regulation and uh, uh, the work that Jade is doing. And I want to be upfront that I come with an agenda today, and that is to promote research in relation to regulation, quality management and auditing in disability services. So often in this area, the design of regulatory systems is reactive and often by lawyers in commissions of inquiry in response to scandals, rather than having a wider evidence base and being informed by a range of disciplinary perspectives. So if there is an established researcher or prospective PhD students who are interested in these areas, I'm very happy to chat. And if there are prospective PhD students, I should mention that La Trobe has access to scholarships under the industry PhD scheme. So the issues we're discussing are of great practical importance because of the demonstrated abuse and neglect of people with disability. In both Australia and Britain, criminal investigations are underway about the abuse and neglect of people. In both countries, questions are being asked about the regulation of providers and about the role of regulators. The latest British scandal is particularly challenging for regulation and that's the Wharton Hall scandal of last year. An undercover journalist captured on camera the physical abuse and psychological torture of people with disability. Yet the English care regulator, the Care Quality Commission, had rated the provider as being good just a short while before. And it was interesting to see the video of the British Parliament's Human Rights Committee as they conducted an inquiry into this issue and as the committee members grappled in real time with the issue of how to improve regulation. In Australia, we of course have just had the release of the report by uh, Mr Robertson, a former judge of the Federal Court in relation to the NDIS Commission's uh, management of integrity care. So these issues are very live. The quotes from the writer from the recent series of articles on Crikey, and this presentation will place the Australian system in context. So these are the three things I'll be covering. A very quick overview of what is a quite complex scheme, the NDIS quality and safeguarding system. Then I'll talk about what we can learn from the theory and research into re regulating human services. And finally, some tentative ideas towards research agenda. So let's go to the NDIS quality and safeguarding system, but I want to go to two matters of context first. And that is to, first one is to remind everybody that of course, the NDIS quality and safeguarding system sits aside other systems of regulation, such as the criminal law. So the care for the late Annie Smith is before the courts in South Australia charged with manslaughter. Other regulatory systems which exist besides the criminal law include the work health and safety legislation or as you'd call it in Victoria, the occupational health and safety system. And uh, again, in Annie Smith's case, the Safe Work South Australia has announced that they are conducting an inquiry into the governance and management of integrity care. And of course, work health and safety legislation operates not just in relation to workers, but to anybody in the workplace. So that will pick up uh, the issue of the quality of the care provided to Annie. And work health and safety legislation also has a criminal scheme attached to it. We also have some of the state-based systems. Victorious is the most extensive with its disability worker regulation scheme. When trying to make sense of the NDIS quality and safeguarding system and NDIS itself, I think it's useful to apply um, 
institutional logics. And um, this, this body of work comes out of sociology. We can see, I think, four institutional logics at work in NDIS itself and in the quality and safeguarding scheme. So clearly there's the emphasis on human rights. And so in the legislation, we get the explicit reference to the UN Convention uh, of the Rights of Persons with Disabilities. We also have a logic about markets and that's captured in the mantra of choice and control. But we also have to acknowledge that there are limitations in markets. We have the bureaucratic state and those who have ever needed to challenge a decision of the NDIA uh, will appreciate how bureaucratic and rule bound it can be. And finally, we had the protective state. Government is a protector of people who are considered vulnerable. Of course, not all people with disability are vulnerable. So some people are, and they need to be protected under the NDIS and also the quality and safeguarding scheme. So in any large scheme, such as the two we're discussing today, it's inevitable that there are multiple institutional logics at work, and it is inevitable that there are clashes or rivalry between these logics. And the interesting practical question and interesting research question then becomes how are these competing logics managed? The NDIS quality and safeguarding system is more than the NDIS commission. As explained in the framework document for the scheme, it has elements in relation to participants, workers and providers. And it also has developmental features, preventative features and corrective features. So to give you some examples of each of these, and I'll basically work on the diagonal starting from the top left hand corner. For participants through the ILC scheme, the information linkages and capacity building scheme, there has been some degree of investment in self-advocacy for participants. That's developmental in its approach. For workers uh, in the preventive mode, we have the worker screening system. For providers in the corrective mode, we have the mechanisms for reportable incidents, for complaints, and then the compliance powers themselves. So in many ways, the framework is quite comprehensive. Um, it is so comprehensive, um, and I don't know about Jade, but on, on my shelves behind me, I have two eight centimetre thick folders just of materials on the current quality and safeguarding scheme. Uh, so you have to consider the act. There are rules, code of conduct, complaints, etc. They're the practice standards written or supposedly written at the outcome level and the quality indicators. You have modules under the practice standards, guidelines, guidance, and then the interaction with the state acts uh, and policies such as those for the authorization of restrictive practices and worker checks. The scheme has a very extensive compliance regime. The NDIS Commission's compliance powers are vastly stronger than those that exist for other human services, such as for aged care or for childcare. So for breaches of the code of conduct, for example, individual workers can be subject to penalties of up to $55,500 and providers $277,500. The scheme explicitly uses, as reflected in the explanatory mem memorandum for the amending act, the concept of the compliance pyramid, which is based in the classic work of Ayers and Braithwaite. And so for the notion of the compliance pyramid is that the overwhelming majority of providers and workers want to do the right thing. And so therefore you should have an extensive education persuasion uh, uh, persuasion and compliance support. However, if workers or providers fail to cooperate or breach the um, requirements in significant ways, then you can go up the pyramid, uh, going from infringement notices um, with associated fees, civil penalties, the revocation of registration, or ultimately banning orders. 
there are some common challenges in quality auditing and I think um, credit has to be given to those who designed the NDIS scheme that they obviously put in considerable thought into trying to make the audit scheme as robust as possible. I've got to say in a moment I'll talk about the limitations but let me talk about the strengths first. So on the left hand side of the table are some common challenges which uh, have been identified in research and inquiries into where auditing has failed and on the right hand column is how these have been addressed within the NDIS quality and safeguarding scheme. Most of these items come with an asterisk denoting that there are limitations in the response. But I think the designers of the auditing scheme do deserve credit that they, their design of the scheme was clearly informed by uh, pr uh, previous problems in regulation and in auditing. But what are some of the limitations? The first one for me is that the NDIA and the NDIS Commission appear not to talk to each other about key policy changes in the NDIS. And I'll give two examples. And I'm not saying that's across the board, but I'll give two examples which will be meaningful to frontline workers and also to providers. So the first one is they recently changed the ratio of support, that is the number of uh, workers supported by a team leader in the cost pricing model. The NDIA also made changes to uh, the SIL pricing model. Both of these changes have incredible, potentially quite significant um, impacts on the quality that providers are able to provide. I lodged FOI applications to obtain all communication between the NDIA and the NDIS Commission um, in relation to those changes. Uh, both applications were refused on the basis that there were no documents to discover. A second limitation is that the quality and safeguarding scheme does not apply to the NDIA itself. And yet the NDIA is making critical decisions about the lives of participants. And in the report of Mr. Uh, Robertson last Friday on the NDIS Commission, I think he actually had more to say that, about the NDIA and its processes and their impacts on quality and safeguarding than he did uh, on the NDIS Commission. And the question has to be asked if frontline workers and providers are subject to the, that compliance regime and the penalties, then why aren't the NDIA and its staff? Because they're making critical decisions about the lives of participants as well. The quality and safeguarding system does not apply fully to non-registered providers. So even if there is a death of a person with disability in the care of a non-registered provider, that is not reportable to the Commission under the reportable incident rules. A fourth limitation is that the scheme only applies to NDIS service provision. So to give an example here, they put a lot of effort and rightly so in relation to the regulation of restrictive practices by providers. But for that many people living with disability at home, they can be subject to restrictive practices in the home by their own family. And yet those restrictive practices are not regulated at all. And sometimes you hear stories from providers that families get very frustrated with providers that they can't imp implement a practice because it is a restrictive practice or that they have to go through an authorization process, which just highlights um, that in some ways we're not truly concerned with the human rights of people with disability uh, in the context of restrictive practices until we actually regulate inside the family home. A fifth limitation is the audit methods. And although it's pleasing to see the emphasis that the Commission in their audit guidelines give to the voice of people, of participants, and to the voice of workers, there are obvious limitations in this. And um, it's been great to see the work that has come out of the Latrobe Centre in relation to methods such as actual observation of practice, especially for those people who do not have uh, oral communication. 
A sixth limitation has been the status of the official visitor schemes. Um, uh, in terms of the status quo, they don't exist in two states at all. There are various practices in the other states and territories, but the Robertson Report has recommended that the NDIS Commission develop its own scheme. And finally, there's the question of alignment with other regulatory systems, such as work health and safety. And many uh, workers and providers will report a feeling that when it comes to supposed rights, um, Sorry, I'll rephrase that. The rights of workers not to be harmed uh, at work compared to the human rights of people with uh, disability not to be subject to restrictive practices. There seems to be a presumption that work health and safety issues will always prevail, even if there's no empirical evidence to uh, support uh, their priority over human rights. Okay, I'll move on to um, issues of regulating human services. And here, I think Australians can be proud that Australian scholars are significant international players in the field of regulation, with the RegNet group at the Australian National University being prominent in the field. There's also the National Regulators Community of Practice uh, run through the Australian and New Zealand School of Government attached to the University of Melbourne. And I want to give full credit too to the contributions of Jade, uh, Chris and Jacinta in relation to quality and disability services. Indeed, I want to uh, pay tribute to the range of extraordinary work which is coming out of the La Trobe Centre. When we look, think about the regulation of human services, um, it's, I, I was um, incredibly uh, impressed with the work of Braithwaite Mackay and Braithwaite, um, who conducted a 20-year research program in relation to the regulation of aged care services. And um, in their book, which incidentally is available to download free of charge from uh, the Braithwaite's website, um, they point out um, how much has been achieved across time and say how some of the things we now take for granted were not taken for granted originally. So these are some of the achievements. Firstly, we've moved from regulation of components, such as detailed regulation of catering in aged care to integrated regulation. We've moved from static regulation, uh, that is static achievement of standards to the notion of continuous improvement. We've moved from a focus on individual events to systems thinking and triple loop learning. So learning at the local level, learning, applying that learning across the organisation, and then applying that learning further still across the, across the sector. And associated with that, we've moved from event-driven analysis, which often involve blame and train, blaming and training those who uh, uh, were involved in uh, an incident to root cause analysis, to recognise the underlying reasons for an incident. So when you're designing a regulatory system, you have two choices. You can go for rules-based regulation or you can go for principles-based regulation. There's no pure types and indeed in the NDIS, NDIS quality and safeguarding system, we have um, examples of both. So we have behaviour support rules, complaint rules and incident management rules. We also have at the principal's end the code of conduct which is very broad in its term or the practice standards. When you're designing a regulatory system you have a choice as to where you go on this spectrum and there's advantages and disadvantages of any of those choices. So rule-based regulation has the benefit of certainty for the regulator and the regulated but it has the disadvantage that unless the rule is drafted in exactly the right way, then the purpose of the rule can actually be frustrated. Principle-based regulation is more generic and therefore potentially more powerful. However, it's sometimes claimed that principle-based regulation is not possible, possible for people who have no principles. I think that's overstating the case somewhat, but there is uh, an element of truth in that claim. 
If you want a more sophisticated analysis, you could actually add a vertical uh, axis as well with formal aspects of regulation at the top end of the axis and practiced aspects of regulation at the other. The NDIS Commission is arguably mo more focused on formal regulation than informal. And I think there are, there's three regular uh, explanations for that. There are new regulator, there are regulator of thousands of providers. So, you know, they have limited capacity to do informal regulation. And at this stage, it only has 300 staff, though with the recommendations of the announcement of the minister last week, I think it's, I'll go up to 400 staff. So what are some of the key issues in regulation theory, research and practice? I'm just going to pick two from this very long list to bring out some uh, elements of interest. The first is the issue of responsive regulation which is associated with the compliance pyramid we talked about before. And so the literature, the theory on regulation talks about the benign big stick. And um, so Graham um, Head, the NDIS commissioner, from time to time will make statements like, I will have no hesitation in cancelling the registration of even the largest provider if they are doing the wrong thing. So it's a very big stick that the commissioner wields, but in many ways it's benign because of course, overwhelmingly providers and workers want to do the good, good thing and it, uh, the right thing. And even those who may sort of waver on occasions know that the commission holds this very big stick and therefore they will uh, comply. The second, um, notion in the literature is what's called tit-for-tat regulation. And it's not about the behaviour of adolescents nor politicians. It's rather about the concept of the pyramid. And so if a regulator is finding that a regulated entity is not cooperating, it escalates up the pyramid. It goes higher in the pyramid, taking a more serious response. But likewise, if the regulated entity is cooperating or starts cooperating, it can, if it wants, go down the pyramid. And the reasons why it might want to do that is because, of course, as you go up the pyramid, the more time, attention and expense of the regulator is required and its resources are limited. So if the regulator was to go full bore in relation to every breach of every standard, it would um, only possibly be able to handle, you know, 20 or 30 cases a year. And that's not very effective when what you want is triple loop learning across the sector. So the second thing I'd mention is the associated concept of risk-based regulation. And this is captured in Malcolm Sparrow's oft-repeated comment. Pick important, if you're a regulator, pick important problems fix them, and then tell everybody about it. We see some of that approach with the Commission's work on restrictive practices and their recent report on deaths of people with disability. But there is not as much of that as one would hope. So for example, the Commission holds enormous data in relation to um, where uh, providers are struggling in terms of their quality management systems. Uh, compliance with the practice standards. But we have at this stage no feedback from the Commission about what providers and workers can do to help achieve those standards. So I'm on the closing run and here I just want to contribute some preliminary ideas towards a research agenda on regulation of disability service provision. And I'll be presenting some ideas in three different categories. Firstly, in relation to structures, then in relation to actors in the system, and finally, a particular sort of actor and, and acting, which is auditors and auditing. So to highlight some of the issues here, um, there's actually very little research on the effectiveness of regulation and whether regulation actually makes a difference. There is absolutely some, but there's not as much as you would hope for. And I 
think that there's no doubt that um, regulation has improved the quality uh, uh, of uh, Australia's disability support system. But the question I'd pose is, when does regulation improve quality and safeguarding? And, and when it does, what are the levers of change? When it doesn't, why doesn't it? These are basic questions, which I don't believe have been answered, especially in the context of disability services. In relation to actors, I'd love to sit down and chat and talk to uh, the staff of the NDIS Commission and other regulators about how they actually manage those rival institutional logics that we talked about at the start of the um, presentation. Um, a second question I'd highlight here is how do people with disability as prospective customers assess organisational quality and safeguarding? And there is a very nice paper by Turnpity and Beadle Brown back from 2014, which suggests that quality management systems, quality accreditations have very little impact on customer choice. Now, if the whole point of the system is to promote customer, uh, informed customer choice, then um, that's a really interesting finding. And one of the areas I'm interested in um, is the work of auditors and auditing. Professor Michael Power from the London School of Economics has done some amazing work, essentially deconstructing financial auditing and auditing of environmental systems and to a lesser extent, quality auditing. Um, we need to see that work on quality auditing extended. A big issue of concern for um, scholars of auditing, such as my colleague Yu Yu Zhang, is the issue of audit quality. That is, in financial auditing, how do you ensure that the audit is of quality? We need to, similar sort of work on quality auditing. That is, how do we get audit quality and quality auditing? Um, I hope. Um, what I've presented this afternoon has uh, raised some interesting issues. Um, I hope that it uh, certainly uh, provokes research interest. Um, if you would like to follow up and uh, have a discussion about any of the issues I've discovered uh, uh, discussed today offline, I'd be happy to do that. But obviously, I'm happy to take questions and comments now. Thank you very much, Alan. That was a really, really interesting. It raises a lot of issues and it, I think it puts it in a framework for us to think about some of those things. Um, so for people who haven't uh, participated before, you can use the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen, um, to put up questions. Um, I'm afraid we can't, we can't deal with unmuting everybody. We can't do that in this particular mode of Zoom. So if you've got questions, please put them up in the Q&A. But I want, I want to ask a question first, because there's lots of, lots of food for thought there. But one of the things that you raised, and I know it's a big issue in the sector at the moment, about um, the impact of NDIS funding on quality, and that really the Safeguarding Commission is sort of powerless to do anything about that. So my question is, though, is it possible for the NDIS Commission to lever um, impact about quality by putting in place rules um, in its practice standards about things that providers must have? So for example, could they make a rule um, that every provider of supported accommodation services must provide training to their staff in active support and must have a trained practice leader in place for a particular ratio of, of houses to um, staff. I mean, can, can, couldn't they do that? Isn't that the way around that issue? Um, so I think there's two aspects to this, Chris, and they need to be separated. In relation to the NDIA's practices, the NDIA, uh, the NDIS Commission has no jurisdiction over the NDIA and they make that very clear uh, on their website. Um, in my submission to the Parliamentary Select Committee, which is uh, conducting hearings in relation to uh, the NDIS Commission, I have urged the uh, committee to consider requiring the NDIS Commission to issue 
practice standards for the NDIA and indeed to audit the, the agency in relation to its compliance with those practice standards. Moving on to the um, issue around um, what providers do and providers of supported accommodation, it absolutely is in the discretion of the Commission to extend uh, its practice standards, uh, its rules in relation to um, active support and practice leadership. And I think there's a very strong case for doing that. And if it did that, then that would add to the pressure for the, on the NDIA to provide adequate funding for those things to be put in place. So it's a sure. sort of two-way You're problem. much more optimistic about um, uh, how the NDIA might respond than I am. <laughs> Got to be optimistic in this world. Okay, so the first question um, is really interesting. I think it builds on your last set of slides about the research priorities. Um, Gilbert says, given the lack of available data and comprehensive reporting in and from government bodies, what research is most needed to improve the situation in the sector for participants and service providers? That's a big question. It is indeed. Um, uh, and obviously the Commission is a young regulator. And just as we've seen improvements in the quality of data released by the NDIA in relation to the NDIS, uh, we can expect that over time the Commission will release more data. Um, I've, um, uh, and obviously, uh, as researchers, we would like that data uh, de-identified uh, to be in the public domain so it can inform research and thus through research better inform practice. Um, but one of the simple things that I think the Commission can do is what the Disability Service Commission in Victoria has done, the New South Wales Ombudsman or the Queensland Public Advocate, and that is um, release research reports on serious incidents and um, what providers uh, did in those uh, circumstances which contributed to those incidents. That's a very simple thing that it can do. It's in part captured in that the recent report they have published, um, but I think it needs to be extended. Mm. So there's a huge amount of data there that's just there, if only it could be available to play around with. Okay, so the, the next question is from a, um, uh, somebody who's a service user who suggests how can, how can, is it possible to get good quality service, good services, um, and for regulation to be effective in a situation where there's still much more demand than supply in the market so that competition isn't working to get quality. Um. And, and obviously that depends on where you are in Australia um, and which particular services you're seeking to obtain. Um, uh, for example, um, if you're uh, requiring support in relation to restrictive practices. Um, I recently had the misfortune of reading some reports done by so-called professionals in relation to positive behaviour support, and I was shocked at how poor they were. Um, so, um, but to answer your question in a very practical way, um, I think it's about um, doing your, your homework as much as you can but recognising that the market of supply is limited and sometimes compromises have to be made. Um, and this is one of the elements which is missing from the design of the uh, overall quality and safeguarding system. Government's been very keen to put responsibilities on providers, but providers are just one element of the system. Um, just to answer a general question, um we will circulate the slides to people. They'll be on our website and Alan's detailed contract contacts will be on those slides and he can, we'll just repeat them at the end when we've finished. Um, there's a, a really interesting question. Can you please discuss the tension between the rights of people with disabilities to be safe and have choice and control and the lack of duty of care that arises as a result of the transactional nature of service delivery as de defined in service agreements? Um, great point, great question. Um, I think it's more of a comment than a question. Um, it, uh, so the 
person who asked that question, um, exactly the same points were made by Mr. Robertson uh, in his report on the NDIS Commission. Um, it, this issue arises over and over again um, from simple things like um, supposedly providers are responsible for co-creating outcomes with the people they're supporting, but how do you create an outcome where that total support might be three hours a week? And yet the outcomes are written at, at, at a quality of life, whole of life standard. Um, it's a bit of a nonsense. The transactional uh, nature of the support um, can be highly problematic um, in all sorts of areas, but one which comes to mind is support of people with psychosocial disability, where if you're just um, delivering uh, purchase support, you know, um, I want support in the home to do cleaning. Um, well, is that actually, that's consumer choice of control and that's consistent with recovery principles and absolutely it can result in uh, improvements in quality of people's life. But sometimes it's not actually, it's more, much more transactional in nature with very little outcome other than a clean house on a particular day, which is a very good thing. <laughs> Yeah, that's a really complicated issue. Um, so Ben says, thanks for the thought provoking presentation, Alan. How does the NDIS Commission compare to the effectiveness of other bodies in other jurisdictions? Um, which, um, and what do you know about other jurisdictions and what does the literature say? Um, so there's very little literature on this. Um, and of course, the regulatory systems vary so much between country. The one uh, that I have been uh, paying most attention to is the Care Quality Commission for England and Wales. Um, and um, they uh, have, they suffered substantial embarrassment and of course, quite a detail of critical questioning of their processes in relation to uh, the Walton Hall scandal. Uh, what's really concerning is, of course, you know, we had Winterhorn View back in 2011, also uh, abuse being documented by means of an undercover journalist. Here we are, um, eight years later, we have exactly the same thing. Um, why hasn't regulation made a difference in that case? Um, and uh, the report of the um, Human Rights Committee of the British Parliament, the previous Parliament, was that essentially those particular institutions, the assessment and treatment units for people with intellectual disability and or autism were simply needed to be shut down. There was no solution in terms of regulation. They needed to be shut down. The only way of keeping people safe was to prevent people going into those institutions in the first place. Yeah, we've just um, had some conversation, had some contact with somebody who's who's been asked to do an independent review of the CQC uh, behaviour in that Wharton Hall um, uh, situation. But I think the issue of uh, you know a simple s solution of closing down assessment and treatment units without understanding why people were going to those places in the first place, you know, it's clear that that wasn't a pr wasn't a good strategy. Um, there's and that's both the professional issues, Chris, and also that in some cases they were going into those uh, units because of the effects of austerity on community services. Yes, that's right. And, and also th there's great divergence in the quality of those units. Some of those units had some very, very high class professionals um, that were doing very good work and some were privatised and, you know, we can see the type of work they've been doing in the scandals. So, you know, it's you can't task something with the same brush across the board. Um, a question from, Carol, from Coral, who's a very experienced support coordinator. She says, hi, Alan. Why do you think there's a preoccupation of disability service providers on positive behavior support plans for any type of behavior or, um, or concern, behavior of concern shown by participants? And I might add to that, why do you think there's, a, there's an obsession about positive behavior support from the NDIS Safeguarding Commission? Um, as opposed to any other ways of thinking about supporting people who may have 
uh, difficult or emotionally challenging behaviour? Um, I don't think I'm qualified to comment on, answer those questions. Um, it is good that the NDIS Commission has focused attention on uh, uh, restrictive practices, in particular in the context of positive behaviour support. Um, but that there are many ways that people can be subject to abuse and neglect uh, than restrictive practices. And over time, obviously, we would welcome attention being paid, equal attention being paid to those areas as well. And it would be really good to think about, you know, other evidence-based strategies for supporting people with difficult behaviour. Um, you know, there, there isn't that much evidence about the success of positive behaviour support, primarily because it's very, very rarely fully implemented according to its theoretical principles. Um, there's a question that says, do you find finance... I don't quite understand this. Do you find finance margins, the ability to train staff, et cetera? I think that's only half a question. Maybe whoever asked, put that in, somebody called Chris, could you uh, maybe type in a bit more so we can understand it? Um, there's a question from Kai says, what do you see as the key risks um, to challenges for audit quality in a decentralized model for the audit function? Do you have any ideas on the strategies mechanisms to promote more consistency between auditors in this decentralised, uh, privatised model? Um, so thank you, Kai. Um, uh, on the slide, I talked about the um, uh, paper by Kaska and Corbett, which summarises um, a whole body of work in relation to uh, audit systems. Um, you will never get full consistency between quality auditors and especially not when you're adopting uh, the, the practice standards are principles based. Um, I think it's an un, unrealistic expectation, but certainly uh, the commission has a role to, and they may be doing this, but it's really hard as an outsider to know because they're not terribly communicative about some things. They are about others, but this would be an example where they, they're not. Do they actually, share with their quality auditors the issues which are, are emerging as trends across all the audits conducted by the Commission. Um, it, are they sharing that information not only with the auditors but also providers and workers? Because, you know, the overwhelming majority of providers and workers want to do the right thing and there is nothing like examples uh, which help people to learn. Um, so they'd be uh, some of the things. I think the um, audit guidelines, you know, they're a very extensive document. Um, I'm always hesitant to suggest they, that um, uh, rules be made even more extensive. Uh, I, uh, my focus would be more on what is the learning, what are the mechanisms for learning between the Commission and the auditors. Mm. So are they analysing the data that's coming out of all those, you know, all those audit reports and sharing that and learning from it? Yeah. And they may be doing that at the moment with the auditors, but that information certainly hasn't been made publicly available for providers and workers. Yeah, I think that's, that's a really important point. Um, there's a, a comment from Trudy. She says, what impact do you feel the movement of the OPA, which is the Victorian Community Visitors Jurisdiction, to a nationally based service? Um, what would be the impact when, when the situations like Annie happened in South Australia? Restrictive practices happened and the police said today that the workers are refusing to respond to their questions. Ooh. I think there's two questions in there. Are there implications about moving community visitors, some of which are very sound, particularly the one in Victoria, moving them to a national scheme? Um, and do you have some comments about the South Australian situation? and what's happening there with workers refusing to talk? Um, given that the, the idea of a national community visitor scheme only came out, was uh, received um, authorization or uh, commendation rather uh, through the Robertson inquiry last week, although that we did have the uh, prior paper on the future of community visitor schemes, it's far too early to comment on whether it will be a superior or inferior scheme. 
um, compared to current arrangements for Victoria. Um, in relation to uh, South Australia um, and integrity care, like you, I was very concerned to read in yesterday's uh, news that the uh, workers and management of integrity care had declined to cooperate uh, with police. Uh, bear in mind, though, that the police are conducting a criminal investigation. Work cover, uh, work say South Australia is conducting in the, uh, an investigation under its legislation. Um, it is not unusual for uh, lawyers to advise uh, people uh, who may be subject to charges not to cooperate. It's not their, their role to uh, make out the Crown's case against them. On the other hand, what occurred with Annie must never occur in Australia again, if we cannot all help it. Mm, thank you. Um, coming back to Chris, who's uh, retyped um, what she wanted to say. Do you find that financial margins imposed on providers through the price guide are limiting the ability to provide training to staff? This goes back to Absolutely. the funding and quality. Um, we all know that um, uh, the pricing has improved and, and that has to be acknowledged um, compared to the, you know, going back to the very start of the scheme. But the NDIA set through its pricing uh, scheme, set up a whole process where providers cut back, cut back, cut back training as much as possible. They cut back team meetings. And yet the research coming out from Latrobe validates the importance of practice leadership. And um, uh, yet in, in the NDIA's original frame of thinking, this was la largely about, oh gee, um, supervision is an overhead and overheads need to be minimised. Not that, quite that crude, but certainly a degree of that thinking. Yeah, I mean, I'm very aware of, of one sort of very high quality service that is having to to rethink its entire model because of the change to SIL funding that's going on at the moment that has almost no evidence base for the rationale that's underpinning it. Um, so I think that's a continuing issue that's going to have to be addressed through various means. Um, there's a, there's a, a, a question from Marshall. It says, if we talk about service quality and services provided, and it was raised constantly at the Royal Commission, that the remuneration to support workers was inadequate. What can we do about remuneration in attracting ca capable staff? That's a big question. I'm not sure you can, <laughs> you could have a go. Um, so it's been raised in the context of the Disability Royal Commission. It was raised in the context of the Aged Care Royal Commission. Uh, their workers often being on poorer rates than the disability workers is my understanding. Um, we, as a society, have to make a decision whether we are going to remunerate people in uh, human services appropriately, because if we don't, there are clear consequences to those decisions. Remuneration, however, um, or pricing, is not the sole element at play in quality and safeguarding, of course. Um, there's a question that's a bit similar to the question before about um, having a national community visitors program that could uh, enter and inspect various service delivery settings um, and provide sort of safeguarding for people who don't have the capacity to advocate for themselves or don't have anybody else to do that for. Um, I wonder if maybe you could take that question but also talk a bit more about the issue of, of how do you tackle um, poor quality support or even abuse that happens in family situations. I mean, I think that was something that you mentioned that is really under-researched, what happens in families of, of, of particularly adults with intellectual disabilities and how do you begin to think about um, regulating the quality of what's happening there? Um, let me take that one first. Um, but in some ways, I can't uh, do more than reiterate what I was saying before, that um, governments are not serious, parliaments are not serious about human rights unless they are willing to tackle the issue of abuse of human rights in the family home. That, of course, is extremely controversial. Um, and they, you know, it's no surprise that it hasn't been regulated. 
But when I visit service providers, I often hear stories of families being frustrated that what do you mean you, you can't just lock um, our child in the room if they're having a behaviour of concern? That's what we do, why can't you? Why can't you remove the key from the electric wheelchair? Um, all of those sorts of things. It's, if we're serious about human rights, we must ta tackle this issue. And we must have regulation inside the home as well as regulation of disability service providers. Um, in relation to the former issue of um, capacity, it was interesting to read in the Robertson uh, inquiry that uh, in the view of Mr Robertson, uh, Annie Smith probably had capacity um, right throughout the period with possible exception the last couple of weeks uh, of her life. Um, she had legal capacity to make her own decisions. What really drove, was driven home for me and uh, um, was th the difference between vulnerability and capacity. And sometimes we equate those issues, but in fact, they're two quite separate phenomena. So she really didn't have a context or a situation where she could exercise that capacity effectively. So that, that's what you mean. That's right. And of course, um, under all the uh, community visitor schemes, Sorry, I shouldn't say all, I don't know all of them in Australia, um, but in many of them, um, Annie would not have had a community visitor come and visit her because she was in her own home. And of course, she needed to invite uh, people into her own home. For whatever reason, um, uh, she eventually got into a situation where it appears the carer was the only person in her life. And I think increasingly we're, ha we're moving to a dispersed service system where more and more people are receiving services, you know, in their own homes in an individual type of situation. And we don't have a lot of experience about what quality of support looks like, how you do good supervision in those situations and, and how, you, how you regulate them, um, you know, which is the sort of, there's families which are, which are unregulated and then the sort of drop in support in your own home we really don't regulate that very much and but we've quite well we've got more knowledge about regulating sort of more closed environments haven't we would you agree with that yes so i think we're we're oh hang on let me just see if there's um So maybe just to finish off, would you like to just comment on a, um, on uh, William's comment? Um, Alan, you've said that society, we can't afford to have another death like Annie, but what's stopping another death happening again, do you think? Or what would be the most important thing that could stop it? So um, I don't think there can be any guarantees that we will not have another death um, like Annie's. It would be naive to think that we can guarantee that doesn't occur. What uh, occurred to Annie was the co result of multiple uh, failures. Oh, I'm, and I'm not um, um, detracting in any way from uh, the alleged, and I, I have to use the word alleged, actions of her carer. Um, I am not uh, limiting in any way the culpability of the alleged reported failures of uh, integrity care, although both of those allegations have to be tested before the courts before we can uh, say what's true. But um, part of the solution has to be all of us in the entire community reaching out to individuals we know are isolated and we know might be vulnerable and just seeing how they're doing. If one person, one of Annie's friends, one of her neighbours had done that, that we might have uh, been able to prevent her death. So it's a whole layer of, of from individual workers to services 
to the system as a whole, but also the bigger factor about the social exclusion and isolation that people with disabilities experience. And that's a, that's a community uh, inclusive cohesion uh, type of issue, isn't it? And we need to tackle it on all of those, those fronts. Yeah, thank you. Um, Go on. Uh, um, James Reason, Professor James Reason, world's leading authority probably on health and safety issues, talks about the Swiss cheese model of multiple layers of defence being needed, but every default defence has holes. And when those holes align, as they did in Annie's case, uh, tragedy occurs. Okay, th thank you so much. It's four o'clock now. That's been a really interesting discussion. Thank you so much for agreeing to talk today. Um, we'll have some virtual claps. Um, and those of you who are on uh, Zoom, we're just going to have a, a two minute break. So you can get up and have a stretch or go to the loo or get a cup of coffee. And we're going to reconvene at like three minutes past four. It's one minute past four now. Uh, so go up and go and do what you have to do and come back in a minute. Thanks very much. Well done, Alan. That was great. Really enjoyed that. What do I do to unshare? It should be just up the top, like, you know, where the red button is up the top, it should say unshare. It's no, you just you just start putting up your slides now, Jade. Oh, it'll do it. Okay. Hold on, move you guys down here. Mm -hmm. Perfect. There we go. I'll put you up top there. Right. I'm good to go, but I'm going to take Chris's uh, lead and quickly use the loo, and I'll be right back. Okay. That was great. Really enjoyed it. Thank you. It was very kind of you to, to mention me, Alan. I was taken aback by that. Um, so thank you. And yeah, I've written a few, you raised a few points I've noted. And I really do think that we should talk at some point because um, some of the things you said, I thought, uh, yeah, there's, there's correlations between some of the stuff I've, I've been doing and, and your work and... Jade, we're live. Everyone can hear this, just so you know. Okay. Be lovely to talk shop. Okay. Okay, we might uh, start again. Um, is everybody back? We've got 100 people online. So uh, welcome back to the second half of the seminar. Um, and our wonderful PhD student, Jade McEwen, is going to uh, talk about some of the findings from the study she's been doing over the last few years. Jade's a, a very experienced uh, quality person. She's been involved in quality management and in auditing and she threw up her hands a few years ago and said I need to understand more depth about all of this. It's not working well and she turned up at our front door and Jacinta and I have been supervising her ever since and um, she's going to make a great contribution with the thesis. 
So she's going to talk about administrative compliance or personal outcomes, exploring service quality from the perspectives of leaders and frontline staff within disability day service organisations. So over to you, Jade. Okay, thanks, Chris. <clears throat> so um, welcome everybody. Thank you ever so much for coming. As Chris said, um, I'm Jade McEwen, PhD candidate with the Trobe Living with Disability Research Centre. I'm lucky enough to be studying under professors um, Chris Bigby and Jacinta Douglas. And as Chris said, um, the focus of the talk today is, is about how service quality is perceived um, and monitored within disability day services. I'm sure most of you do know, but for those of you who may not, day services provide support to adults with intellectual disability um, in the form of recreational and educational supports. So a little bit of background about this research. So for the past 30 years uh, or more, Australian governments have set the tone about what service quality is and how it's monitored within disability services throughout Australia. And how they did that was predominantly by developing quality standards that disability services must comply with in order to receive funding or remain registered to uh, provide support to people with intellectual disabilities. How services prove that they comply with those quality standards is usually via a process called an audit. Um, and the audit process involves an individual or individuals coming into an organisation and predominantly reviewing their policies, procedures and records. But we know through that audit process that very little time is actually spent reviewing the quality of the support that people with intellectual disabilities receive. So what that means is that organisations with excellent policies and procedures, but who may provide poor support to individuals, they, could, they might pass audits. But organisations that have poorly written policies and procedures, but provide excellent support, might not pass audits. So for organisations who are interested in monitoring the quality of the support people with intellectual disabilities receive, they can decide whether or not to invest in additional ways of monitoring service quality that go beyond complying with the government's quality standards. But whether or not they do really depends on how they perceive service quality. So, for example, whether or not they believe the government's quality standards, the audit process, to be an adequate way of monitoring service quality or not. But we know little about whether or not services um, adopt additional methods of monitoring service quality, um, let alone how they perceive it. And that's particularly within day service contexts where very little research has been performed on these issues. So a little bit about the aim and method um, of this research. So this research used a constructivist grounded theory methodology to understand the way service quality is perceived within day service organisations. We also explored with leaders, the decision makers of organisations, how they monitored service quality and what factors they believe contributed to good service quality. We had three Melbourne-based disability services take part in this research, 17 staff in total, including nine frontline staff consisting of seven support workers and two team leaders, and eight leaders consisting of two CEOs, two quality managers, two general managers, and two managers. So, Semi-structured interviews were performed, um, consisting you know, about an hour to an hour and a half in duration. And we asked questions like, what do you perceive service quality to be? And how do you know if good service quality has been achieved? What factors influence good service quality? But we also asked leaders, how do you monitor service quality within your day service organisations? Interviews were recorded, transcribed and analysed for themes using line-by-line -line coding. 
So what did we find out? Looking at frontline staff first, frontline day service staff shared similar perceptions about service quality. And that's really interesting because this, many of the staff interviewed worked in different organisations. They'd never met, but they still shared the same views about service quality. Frontline staff's perceptions about service quality were predominantly shaped from their negative experience, their exposure to what they perceived as poor service quality in the day services they'd worked in. And they'd spent a lot of time thinking about that and um, had shaped views about if they could change it, you know, what would good service quality look like? And all of the frontline staff's perceptions of service quality were orientated towards the way people received support, frontline practice, and the ideas and actions that influenced it. So from those interviews with frontline staff, five categories emerged that depicted what they believe good service quality looked like within um, the day service context. So those categories were <clears throat> collaborative hands-on leadership, well-planned services, respect for people with intellectual disabilities and their carers, a culture of continuous improvement, and the professionalization of the support worker role. So digging into that a little bit deeper, what that meant. So staff believed that good service quality, being about collaborative hands-on leadership on the front line, looked like leaders who listened to them, who listened about frontline issues and were really engaged and pursued their feedback and wanted information about what was happening on the front line. Staff also believed that good service quality was about being properly supervised at the coalface. They believed that it was about leaders guiding them, critiquing them, observing them to identify both poor and good quality service provision. Staff also believed that good service quality was about leaders who cared about the outcomes of service users, who had knowledge about issues like quality of life and who were interested in whether or not service provision was maintaining or improving the quality of life of the individuals served. So, in the context of supervising staff, Mary, a support worker with over 20 years experience in a day service setting said, a program that's in the back room, sitting in the back room, sitting heavily in their chairs, a lot of staff on their phones, driving around, they're not quality. So I think that for quality in a centre, I think that the management really need to keep a better eye on staff. Everyone needs to be more accountable about what they are doing in programs. I don't think that's emphasised enough personally. Frontline staff also perceived good service quality to be about well-planned, organised services. And this meant to them that leaders ensured that there was an appropriate match between staff and the services they provide. So for example, if a staff member had a background in horticulture, they would be appropriately matched to a horticultural activity or service. They also believed that flexible hours that allowed for the individualization of supports were very important. Breaking free of the nine to three day service paradigm and delivering supports when people required or requested them, evenings, weekends, um, so on and so forth, really um, was connected to good service quality. Staff also believed that good service quality could be best achieved when they had admin or planning time, uh, time to reflect on the individuals they serve and tailor make services to meet their needs and interests rather than making it up on the fly. Frontline staff believed that good service quality was about having adequate funds and resources to provide high quality services and programs. Um, for example, having enough funds to resource well a cooking program to provide a rich array of ingredients so that people are interested and engaged. Frontline staff also believed that it was a, 
good service quality was about ensuring that ad adequate levels of staffing were available so that staff could provide support beyond people's basic needs so that they could engage and actively um, pursue people's interests and goals. And that point is well il illustrated by Holly, a team leader who says, there's some days where in the back room, people could just be changing all day and feeding them and that's it. They don't have time to do anything else. We've got that many clients and so little staff in our service. Frontline staff also talked about good service quality being about um, respecting people with disabilities and their carers. And what that meant was um, staff who recognised and reported acts of abuse and neglect. And staff communicated that that was about knowing what abuse and neglect looked like, both at the extreme end and the more sort of subtle acts of abuse and neglect, like emotional abuse um, and um, neglecting individuals in, in subtle ways that would have a detrimental effect on their well-being. Staff believe that service users should be treated as adults and peers. Um, so good service quality is about not infantilizing uh, the people they support, treating them like children and working from a, um, a, an aspect of the individual understands rather than they don't. Frontline staff believe that parent and care contributions to planning and evaluation of services should be welcomed and pursued. Um, staff said it's very important to engage with people who are involved in individuals' lives to get a holistic picture of who they were outside of the context of the day service so that they could learn things, share information and ultimately do the best for the people they served. Staff also communicated that good service quality um, could be best achieved when relationships were prioritised um, by staff and leaders. And what that meant was they had time to get to know people. They had time to spend with individuals and get to know who they were, what their needs were, what their interests were, how they communicated so that they could then react accordingly and plan the best services for them possible. And Staff believe that people with disabilities, in order to achieve good service quality, should be co-evaluators of their support. So moving beyond um, recording outcomes and goals uh, using sort of paper-based systems and bringing people into the evaluation of the supports that they receive um, in real time. So Natalie, a support worker, speaks to um, the issues around respect in day services here where she says, well, for me, it's more, I suppose it's treating someone as you wish to be treated. You know, if you don't want to be spoken to in a nasty manner, if you don't want to be left in a dirty incontinence say, for five hours, then yeah, you're not going to do that to anyone else. Frontline staff also associated good service quality um, with a culture of continuous improvement. So staff believed that um, in order to ensure good service quality, leaders should have a strong understanding of quality and evaluation methods. Um, so drawing on methods like observation and a variety of different ways of monitoring service provision that ensured service quality at the coal face. Staff also believed that good service quality could be um, uh, assured more if there was a culture of collaboration and benchmarking with other services. They believed that they were delivering good quality service provision, but were very interested to know what other services did so they could benchmark and be on a journey of continuous improvement. And staff spoke not just about the organisation next door, but arguably, you know, uh, statewide and beyond to try to be ahead of best practice. Frontline staff um, also talked about good service quality being associated with the ability and time to critically reflect um, as part of their everyday practice. Time to sit and think about the supports that they delivered, how they delivered them, and whether or not they were um, adequately meeting the needs of the people that they served. 
And finally, frontline staff spoke about good service quality being about the support worker role, uh, limitations being, being clear. Um, so, so not just limitations, but, but expectations, you know, what, what's involved in the role? What does it look like when we perform it well? And, and in terms of limitations, what, what does professional look like? Where are the boundaries between the person at home and uh, the way that, you know, one behaves in at home outside of the day service and the actual role and what it means to be professional within it. Staff spoke about leaders having a strong understanding about disability, um, that good service quality was best achieved when the leaders that guided their practice, um, critiqued them, uh, had a really good understanding about disability and could help them navigate difficult issues uh, commonly associated with supporting individuals with complex needs. And finally, staff believe that good service quality um, could be best achieved when qualifications for support workers were recognised and rewarded. They spoke to um, the fact that some services don't uh, require qualifications to provide support work and that if the sector were to recognise the importance of knowledge and qualifications, that it might elevate it up and um, encourage better service quality. So Mary, um, a support worker, she speaks to, to that issue and she says, it gets a bit frustrating, you know, you're supposed to be highly qualified and you don't know what, you know, what the different types of epilepsy are or different types of autism. It's a bit frustrating. So <clears throat> moving on to leaders and findings from interviews with leaders, three central topics were explored with leaders. Um, how they perceive service quality, which was what we explored with frontline staff as well. And in addition to that, how they monitored it and what they believe influenced good service quality. So unlike frontline staff, leaders held very contrasting perspectives about what service quality was. And what those contrasting perspectives meant is that within those three topics explored, um, two categories often emerge, uh, contrasting categories. So, so we ended up with six categories in total in relation to those topics. And let's explore what that actually meant and looked like. So when leaders were asked, how do you perceive service quality? We had four leaders who perceive service quality to be about complying with policies, procedures, system efficiencies, complying with standards, and we had four leaders orientating towards service quality being about personal outcomes and the way people experience support. So that contrast is really well illustrated here. Nathan, a general manager for a large disability service who orientated towards a process compliance approach, he says service quality is about making sure that we abide by certain standards, have procedures, whereas in contrast, Tanya, also a general manager for a large disability service, says making service quality is about making sure that staff and clients are safe, achieving good outcomes. A good outcome is, I guess, people are progressing towards the life they want to lead. So when we look at, explored with leaders how they monitored service quality, again, there was strong contrast between leaders interviewed. Four leaders described methods which involved the collection and analysis of evidence or data. This evidence or data was secondary in nature. Um, and what that means is that it was completed by another person and the leader reviewing it was not present at the time it was created. So examples of secondary evidence include records written by staff about service users, complaint, complement or incident data or internal audit reports. So our equality manager speaks to this when she says the internal audits, all the processes are verified. And of course, we've got the external audit process that gives us all our advice about what we should or shouldn't be doing or what we are doing right. 
So again, in contrast um, to leaders who held those views, four of the eight leaders' interviews um, monitored service quality using primary evidence. So primary evidence is um, evidence like direct observation of the way people have been supported, interviews about the quality of the support that people receive. And the reason we called it primary is because they collected it. The person who collected it was also the person who reviewed it and used it to make determinations about service quality. So Priya, a manager of a day service, speaks to this when she says, getting into programs, going out to the groups, seeing how the groups are functioning, how things are happening and all that stuff. It's good to actually see what's, what's happening in the program, how it's going, uh, what works within it and what doesn't work within the program. So then we explored um, what leaders believed uh, contributed to good service quality. And once again, that contrast was very clear. Um, four leaders talked about good service quality being about indirect and external factors. Um, so for example, they described indirect and external factors to be um, an action that they could perform or a resource they could acquire from outside of the day service that they worked for. Uh, good examples are redesign of the service or staffing structure or a resource that they could acquire from an external provider such as training. So Joe, a CEO, speaks to this when he said, training is very much a part of how you instill a quality culture. We did that, came in in October. We had an all in staff training day based on culture. But the other four leaders, they spoke about direct and internal influences on good service quality. So these were described as positive characteristics demonstrated by staff in the day services they worked for, such as a commitment to the people they supported and an ability to problem solve. Leaders also talked about the connection between good service quality and staff who were happy in their role with the tasks they performed. So Ron, a CEO, he says, if you get people of good character with good skills in a proactive environment, I think it's hard not to get good support. So leaders' responses fell into two patterns, depicting two distinct overarching approaches to service quality, uh, an approach focused on process compliance and an approach focused on the way service users experience support. And there was very little that differentiated leaders. Um, we had um, similar positions and similar services. But one thing that did stand out is that the leaders who orientated towards the way people experience support had significantly more experience in day services of providing support to individuals themselves. They had knowledge of frontline issues. Um, and leaders working in similar positions who held opposing views about service quality uh, within the same organisation, were, were often, sorry, in the same organisation. Uh, so for example, we had two CEOs, but they both held completely contrasting views from one, one another. We had two quality managers, completely contrasting views, as were the um, general managers and managers. Similar organisations, similar roles, very different views. So there's lots of food for thought um, in concluding uh, today, but what's interesting, what stuck out is that the majority of people interviewed, um, frontline staff and leaders, perceived service quality to be centred around the support people with intellectual disabilities receive, not on paperwork such as policies and procedures. So there's a disconnect between the methods that are being used by government to monitor service quality and the perceptions of people working within day service organisations. The government's approach to service quality, unfortunately though, means that many, that, that people within day service contexts, regardless of which approach they orientate towards, have little choice but to put their efforts towards 
process compliance in order to comply with audits, receive funding and remain registered to provide supports to people with disabilities. And once again, the thing that stuck out, one of the things that stuck out with this research was that people with more frontline experience were more likely to perceive service quality to be about monitoring the support people with intellectual disabilities receive. So frontline knowledge seems to matter. And another thing that's really interesting is that the findings from this study um, about the way day service uh, staff and day services perceive service quality um, align with research that's come out of accommodation services by people such as Professor Christine Bigby and colleagues. Um, and it, it, you know, in relation to um, uh, the support that individuals receive on the front line. And, and what that tells us is that further research is needed to identify how um, organisational processes and the experience of service users can be adequately monitored in practical ways um, that identify the systems issues, but, but more importantly, the quality of the support that people with intellectual disabilities receive. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Jade. Virtual claps, that was great. Um, there's a whole heap of questions that flow out of that, Jade. Um, there's, the first question is a, is a very long question from somebody um, called Ruth. And I guess the point that she's making just to summarise is that day services are a very sort of uh, seen as a very outdated model of service and sort of based on um, 60s and 70s types of thinking and um, they they really don't give a lot of they have got a lot of constraints about what goes on in them um, so two things I think is do you think that you know the findings that you've got are they applicable to the more sort of decentralized type of day service that we're seeing which is you know a hub and then people going out from the hub to do more individualized things how applicable is what you found from these staff do you think to the sort of newer models that are developing? That's one question. And then the other question is, um, what about the views of people that it service users? And you might want to talk about um, why you decided not to uh, include service users in this. And um, yeah, so over to you. Okay, I'll do my best. So the first thing to say is that this research was conducted in traditional day service settings. It was conducted in uh, uh, settings where group based activities were being um, performed. Um, so I think it speaks to that. But I think uh, more research is needed about, um, you know, these issues and how we can define what service quality looks like at the coal face to adequately monitor it. And what I would say is my, my uh, assumption is that the individualization of the sector just gives more, more impetus to um, invest in, in more research and, and create more practical ways of monitoring service quality at the coalface because of course, you know, that individualization um, is arguably great for people's self-determination, but it also presents risk in terms of people being, um, provided support in more isolated settings uh, away from leaders, practice leaders, other staff. So it's an issue that we have to lean into um, now more than ever. And I guess the second question about service users at the coalface, look, I wanted to invest in this because um, the, the views of staff within services, particularly day services, had, had never been heard. And, um, you know, government have always been the uh, dominant voice on these issues. And I feel, I felt like there might be uh, knowledge and expertise that have never been captured before. Um, and I really wanted to know, you know, how and why uh, in particular leaders were making decisions about service quality, because of course they are the gatekeepers um, within organization about what's, what we invest in um, and whether or not we move beyond uh, compliance and, and all those sorts of issues. So I, I would love to do more research and there's certainly a great interest from my perspective about service users, 
but I think um, this is this was just an area that has never really been explored before. And if I might sort of add, I think you know the the parallels that you've found from you know from a very exploratory inductive type of analysis. The, the findings that you've got map on so clearly to the findings from the much more extensive work that's been done in many other places around supported accommodation, which tends to indicate there's some sort of universal sort of conception out there um, about perceptions of what good quality is that actually then maps on to sort of more objective indicators um, that's been done through observation in supported accommodation so i think it's sort of it's really nice it, it tends to bring those pieces of work together um, and i think we have to say that um, for many of the people that use day services they are people with quite severe and profound intellectual disabilities so trying to understand their perceptions of quality um, is is a very intensive uh, type of, of study that you would have ne needed to you'd have needed to do an ethnographic study and spent a huge amount of time trying to really understand what their perceptions are. They're not the type of group of people that you can just rock up and have an interview with about what they think about their service. So it's it's very difficult, complex research. Um, there's a question from uh, somebody who's a student who says, if service providers are not required to submit the reports, how does government understand and monitor what service providers do? So um, reports, there's lots of different reports. I'm not um, sure about what type of report you, you mean, but um, I'll, I'll try and interpret. If I've got it wrong, let Chris know. Uh, look, what, what I can say is that with the audit process, um, on average, auditors from a, uh, a company which services choose um, so there's sort of a bit of a vested interest from the beginning, come in about once a year and look at policies, procedures and records for a very short period of time. And between that, um, look, there are some mechanisms, uh, certainly in accommodation like community visitors, but, but yes, there is, there's huge, there's huge gaps. Um, and when you think about policies, procedures and records being the dominant form of evidence um, upon which compliance decisions are made, uh, they can be, they can be, you know, developed last minute, they can be doctored. Um, there's a lot of flaws there that I think we need to lean into and ask questions about if we're really going to explore service quality authentically as a sector. You've got a fan here, Some Tamara says, brilliant Jade, you're a master. Um, there's a question from Martin, and I'm not sure you're gonna be able to answer it. I think it's worth saying that your study was about people's perceptions of quality. You weren't measuring actual quality of these services, um, but you might wanna have a go at answering the question, which is, was there any feedback or evidence revealed about the quantity quantity of support delivered. Many of day programs deliver supports on ratios of, you know, one to four or one to three. Mm -hmm. but you, this person's really wondering if you found any evidence to suggest that this actually occurs. So do people actually stick to those ratios? And if it doesn't, is there feedback around the quality and the outcomes and how that impacts? So I think does, does ratio of staff to service user have any impact on quality? Did you pick up any perceptions around that? Yeah, look, we certainly did. Um, and, you know, again, these are issues I think need to be explored more deeply. But one of the um, issues around well, well, um, or well organized uh, services that 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 uh, was came out predominantly from frontline staff was that um, adequate staffing uh, is absolutely essential for good service quality in day service context, because I think it was Holly, the team leader, was talking about uh, there are many days where rather than providing practice leadership, um, being on the front line guiding uh, service provision, she would spend all day in the back room doing nothing but um, feeding individuals, changing incontinence aids. So, so she and others spoke to wanting to go beyond meeting people's basic needs and providing active, engaged support. But to do that, they needed more people. They needed more physical help 
um, to uh, provide what they considered to be adequate support. Okay. Uh, Coral says, did your research cover the topic of conflict of interest issues experienced by day service staff? Well, you've got my interest there. I'd love to know more about what you mean. But um, look, conflict of interest didn't come out of the data per se um, with this, with these interviews, because I, it was deliberately very open. Um, I didn't want to lead anybody. And I asked them what their perceptions were and conflict of interest didn't come up. But what I would say um, is that one of the things, particularly frontline staff uh, raised, was that good service quality is about um, the professionalization of the support worker role. And interestingly, what they said was, you know, the, uh, the difference between someone's at home self and what they kind of bring into the service when they provide support and their work self. And that came from um, staff talking about their observations of colleagues who kind of didn't adjust um, in, in a professional sense in, in the day service setting, they um, acted the same way when they provided support that they did at home. Um, they, they often brought personal issues in, um, joked about in the same way that they did outside of the service. So, you know, there, there were some issues there around um, not so much conflict of interest, but, but you know, I guess in a way it is because um, staff felt that 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 created poor quality support and that there needed to be a clear divide in order to elevate it and provide good service quality. So just to follow up, uh, somebody else has just uh, added in and said conflict of interest in their view is when the day centre is managed by the residential service and there's no choice of whether somebody can go or not to that day service. Yeah. Yeah, look, that's, um, that's not something that staff uh, spoke about. But what I would say is at the time that this research was done, um, I think it was about two years or so ago now the interviews were conducted, um, the NDIS practice standards and kind of the terms around conflict of interest were pretty new. So I'm not sure that, um, you know, that was something that was being discussed at the time. Um, it certainly didn't come up in the conversations I had with people. Okay. Uh, there's a question from a student again. Do you think there's a relationship between service individualization and lack of belonging? That's a bit sort of off topic, but... Um... Lack of belonging. Um, it's so difficult because if I could see people, I could ask a little bit more. About uh, I, think what I think what they're talking about is if you begin to have more individualized atomized services, and not have day centres, is that going um, to impact on people's connections to other people with, with intellectual disabilities and their belonging to a group? I think that's what they mean. Yeah, that makes sense. But, um, but look, I'd, I'd love to answer that, but I think it probably isn't something I could answer from these research findings, but it's certainly a very interesting um, question. And um, I intend to, you know, get off this and, and now review the literature to try and see if anything exists in relation to that question, you've sparked my curiosity. There's some very interesting research that's just uh, being published in, from the UK, which is um, where they've closed a lot of the day services and mm. people have actually been left at home now for long periods of time with, with nothing to support them. And this was a large study that looked at actually self-building communities, which was people with intellectual disabilities being supported to build their own spaces, which actually seem to me to look quite a bit like day services um, or certainly sort of smaller groups of people with disabilities meeting socially um, both that and being supported to be included in other organizations but that sort of social connection uh, with peers that you choose not just anybody with an intellectual disability but chosen peers seems to be something that people started to create for themselves mm. so I think it's a very interesting topic to to follow um, and that article has just been published in Disability and Society and Melanie Nind is the, the lead author on that. Um, Charity, uh, Charity says, it was a great talk, thanks Jade. My question is, for the managers that measure service quality according to service users experience, what methods of monitoring, monitoring did they use? Do they each invent their own methods and measures 
uh, since there's, that's not something that's expected of them and laid down by the Commission. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's really, yeah, it's really interesting. So um, the four leaders who are intended towards uh, the approach um, to service quality, where service, they looked at the way service users experience support, they did, they invented their own um, ways of monitoring service quality, which were predominantly observation and interview. But, but you're right, there's, there was no kind of overarching guide or um, methodology. It was based on their experience and their interpretation of the practice standards. So, and this is interesting, you know, the, the, the practice standards is, is riddled with um, high level abstract concepts around human rights issues like self-determination. They took that interpretation and kind of used their experience as a frame of reference. And then they would observe, observe or interview, um, you know, based on their knowledge of what that looked like. But then, you know, in contrast, the auditors, they monitor those um, concepts, of course, predominantly with policies, procedures and records. So that's that disconnect. And I think that's why we have to do more research to try to quantify, um, you know, what does this stuff actually look like um, at, a, at, you know, in practice. Hmm. Thank you. Maybe that's a task for when you're finished is to develop some observational monitoring tools for, you know, different types of programs. We've certainly got them in, in you know, supported accommodation, but we haven't tried them in other settings. Hmm. Um, there's a question from Trudy. Do you think that COVID-19 has made day centres rethink their model as people with disabilities have been able to use their NDS funding external to the day service model. Also in the past, community visitors were able to monitor residential, uh, but not day services that may be attached to a residential facility. The only communication was the communication book, um, and there was a real disconnect in understanding what happens in a day centre, and this is really the choice, and is this really the choice of the participant? Or is it what's included in the NDIS plan developed by the residential provider? Mm. So do you think models are changing? And <laughs> how do you get this communication between what's happening in different parts of somebody's life? Mm. Big, big questions um, and good questions. Uh, look, at the time, as I say, that this research was conducted, it was you know, very ahead of COVID, no one saw it coming. There were um, bustling group settings and, you know, people were just starting to really, um, well, the, the organisations that, that participated were just starting to talk about what individualised service provision might mean. Um, for what it's worth, anecdotally, I think, you know, many providers are talking about, um, you know, individualised approach to service provision in the context of COVID because, um, they're trying to, you know, deliver service and be safe. Um, but, you know, I think that th there's a, um, a survey going around uh, right now for the La Trobe Living with Disability Research Centre where they're trying to collect some data about COVID and the impact of COVID. So maybe that's something um, if, if people after today could complete, maybe that will be the first time we collect real data about the sorts of issues you raise. Thanks for that plug, Jade. Um, I'll come more to that at the end. I should also just say that uh, we we did a study of what you might call individualisation of day services and different models of supporting community participation uh, a couple of years ago. And we're just, that's published as a report and we've just had one of the papers published around that, which is how you create uh, convivial encounters, individual convivial encounters and the strategies that services can use to do that. There's a danger often that individualization means doing things on your own or with a paid companion, rather than doing that sort of facilitating work to either meet other people or engage in, engage in shared activities. So I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done to really understand what good quality individualization looks like. And, and I guess we've started on, on some of that and continuing to do that. Um, I got waylaid there. So Margot says um, she sees two tensions, understanding and tools of regulators. The tension is troubling, uh, is troubling governing the system. CEOs have to work on resolving this. A second tension is between consumer self-determination and support providers seeking expert knowledge and understandings of quality. 
Is this how you see this? There's interesting systems thinking approaches to managing such tensions so that you can guide good quality. Now, I know Margot comes from a, a governance institutional perspective. So maybe Jade or Alan, you might uh, want to address that issue. Please. Um, so Jade, would you like to go first? <laughs> <laughs> well, um, look, I, I'm not, I'd like to, it, again, it's a shame we're not face to face, so I'd like to unpick it a little bit more and, um, and find out a little bit more about what you, what you mean. But I guess what I would say is that, you know, as the decision makers within organisations, um, CEOs and leaders, you know, have the ability to decide what, what organisations invest in and whether or not, be it um, ways of monitoring service quality or approach to service provision, you know, they are in a good position. And I recognise that they're crushed by the weight of compliance and restrictions and funding and those sorts of things. But when you look at the Royal Commission and some of the issues and themes coming out of it, I, I wonder if, um, you know, we, we have very little choice. I often say to people in the sector, if, um, if our regulators aren't going to monitor the experience of service users, you know, we've, we've got to. Um, if nothing, you know, firstly, from a human rights perspective, but secondly, because, you know, I, I don't think any organisation wants to be um, put in front of a Royal Commission and be asked to explain their actions um, and what they could have done to prevent it. So that's my take. Hope I've responded appropriately. Alan? Um, thanks, Jo. Um, I think part of the answer to this is understanding those institutional logics that I talked about um, in my presentation. And they are indeed inevitably in tension. And um, sometimes one of those logics will have greater uh, power than another. The, it is interesting to see those CEOs, those senior managers who, yes, there is a bureaucratic framework that they have to comply with, but they approach it from a very person-centred, uh, human-centred way. And um, uh, I think there's always scope to um, combine the two, though I admit that there are tensions around that at times. And what about the question of, um, I guess, service user self-direction and choice um, versus uh, expert input about what quality or what a good service might look like uh, how do you deal with tensions between those? Like, do other people know best what somebody needs? Mm. Um, yeah. I think that's just another tension, Alan, if you want to add something. Um, and you see um, in many service types where uh, I'm thinking of psychosocial disability uh, in particular, where I mentioned before the example that the person is purchasing a particular form of support which may not have any contribution to their ongoing outcomes at all. Having said that, I, I think that one always has to be very cautious uh, about asserting what is good or bad for an individual. Um, because um, if we take the perspective that they are the expert in their own life, uh, they're making the right choice. I think we can go too far in that ideology at times, but it's basically true. <laughs> I read a really interesting article yesterday by an English anthropologist who'd spent a year working in uh, some accommodation services in the UK who used this central concept of persuasion and how staff spend a lot of time persuading people to do things that they think they would like to do. Um, mm. So I think it's always a negotiation, but it's, I guess it's who holds the power here and how well those negotiations can be conducted. Um, uh, Karen Stance says, did the research identify the role of consumer satisfaction surveys? Ah, this is something you know about, Jade. And how these may be used to assess quality of services. Uh, this is a common way of assessing how well support might be meeting people's needs. 
leading on from Alan's presentation, what emerged around how feedback complaints incidents can be used to assess and improve service quality. Mm. So, you know, what, what is this consumer satisfaction surveys? How useful are they? Mm -hmm. Well, look, certainly nobody used the terms consumer satisfaction surveys, but, but certainly um, in particular frontline staff interviewed um, when they spoke about good service quality um, can be best achieved when leaders um, have a strong understanding of a variety of evaluation uh, methods. Um, they, they sort of spoke to frustrations of using uh, records and surveys and that kind of data and felt that it would be better for, for leaders to invest in real-time observations of, of staff practices at the coal face to verify their experience of service provision. Um, so that certainly came out particularly with frontline staff and as I say um, with leaders four of the eight leaders orientated towards an approach where they believed, you know, once again, that that sort of coal face view of things yielded more accurate and reliable data than anything that could be achieved via a survey um, or report. Because of course, there's lots of issues there like um, proxy, somebody else completing it, um, acquiescence, uh, people presenting positive views of their experience for fear of you know, um, retribution or um, reprisal. So that that certainly did come out, but in those ways. Thank you. I think we're going to have to draw it to a close because we're four minutes off uh, five o'clock and I know people have got um, commitments. So I just want to finish off uh, and give you a sense of what's coming next and then thank our presenters for today. Um, next, uh, next month, which is the 10th of October, we have uh, two speakers, one which is Jacinta Douglas, who's going to present a sort of overview uh, talk about living well with acquired neurological disability, the things that helped and the things that get in the way. Um, and Dr. Karen Bagley, who is a relatively new academic at La Trobe, who's a social worker who's based in Bendigo, but is part of the Lids Research Centre. And she's going to talk about how personal perspectives shape health professionals' perceptions of uh, FASD uh, and, and the risks. And just uh, that's fetal alcohol syndrome, FASD. And just to uh, let you know that today is FASD Awareness Day, um, in case you've missed that on, on the Twitter. So that will be really two very interesting presentations. And uh, if anybody's missed it, we, we are running a survey, which is part of an international study of 19 countries uh, are seeking uh, to understand the impact that COVID-19 has had on people with intellectual disabilities and their families and their service providers and advocates. So if you fit into any of those categories and you've missed the survey, we would be really grateful um, if you could have a look at it and fill it in. Um, I think the information is on the newsletter that we've sent out from the centre. It's certainly in the Twitter sphere if you look at Lids at La Trobe. Um, and we're in a bit of a competition with our colleagues. So we've only got 100 responses so far from Australia. And the Scandinavians in Sweden have got 580 responses. So I'm trying, hoping that we can sort of match them because they've done COVID-19 very, very differently from the way we've done it. And it would be really interesting to see that contrast. So please, if you've got the survey, um, please fill it in. If you want more information about it, please just contact us at the Living with Disability Research Centre. And just to finish off, thank you so much today to Alan Hoff as a, as a guest and hopefully somebody who's going to have a long association with the centre and with Jade, our PhD student, who very soon hopefully will be finishing and publishing some more work. So thank you very much. It's been a very interesting session and thank you to everybody who's put in questions. So good night. See you in October when we might be out of stage four lockdown in Melbourne. <laughs> bye bye.